Is every roof like this? This place is a f***ing joke. Let's get out of here before we get That was celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay, moments before he was held up by the shark hunting syndicate for trying to expose their illegal multi-billion dollar shark finning industry while he managed to escape alive. Some other celebs on this list got dealt with in the worst ways you can imagine. From Jackie Chan's encounter with the mafia to Steven Seagal getting kidnapped by a mob. Here are 10 times celebrities messed with the wrong gangs. Number 10, 50 Cent. Who has more cred than you living after being shot nine times? I forget, why did the guy shoot you nine times? Was it drugs or something? It was paid to do it. May 24th, 2000. Curtis Jackson became famous under that stage name 50 Cent after he experienced a life-altering event in his grandma's neighborhood. Curtis was standing outside his grandma's house in South Jamaica, Queens, New York, when he became the victim of a drive-by. His grandmother was in the yard planting flowers while he went over to his car to get something. However, out of nowhere, this car pulled up behind him and a guy stepped out of that passenger side shooting 50 nine times. The attack left him with gunshot wounds on his hand, arm, hips, legs, chest, and even his face. This guy was in critical condition and had to undergo multiple surgeries to save his life. This incident made headlines, making many people surprised that a successful artist like 50 Cent had become a target of such violence. Now, the reasons behind the shooting were unclear, leading to various speculations. Some believed it was linked to his involvement in the drug trade, while others thought it might have been a result of a personal dispute. Over time, the truth began to emerge. It was revealed that Curtis here had become a target because of a song he had written. In this song, he dissed a ruthless kingpin, Kenneth Supreme McGriff. If you don't know who that is, well, McGriff was associated with a notorious Supreme Team gang, responsible for a significant drug network and many murders in New York. But while 50 Cent didn't personally retaliate the attack, he revealed years later that the man who pulled the trigger was Daryl Homo Baum, one of Mike Tyson's closest friends. And three weeks after his incident, Homo was shot dead in a gang attack. Number 9, Jackie Chan. Now, if there's one thing we know about this legendary Chinese actor, it's the fact that he fights a lot of bad guys in his movies. But who would have thought that Jackie somehow had also fought some really bad guys in real life? And these guys weren't just any bad guys. They were members of the Chinese criminal syndicate, the Triad. The Triad might not be as powerful as Japan's Yakuza, but take my word for it, they're just as dangerous and extremely ruthless in their operations. They came out of Hong Kong and are involved in every crime you can possibly think of. Drug trafficking, human trafficking, you name it. However, it was when they infiltrated the Chinese movie industry that they had their first encounter with Jackie Chan. Now, unlike the Yakuza or other mafia groups that actually support the movie industry in their base country, the Triad did the opposite. They demanded outrageous amounts of money from producers and production companies while they were on set. In tough situations, they would destroy an entire set if their demands weren't met. These happenings took place around the 70s when Jackie was just a breakout star in China. He did star in a few blockbuster movies like Fist of Fury and Snake in the Eagle's Shadow, making him a household name in Hong Kong. It was at this point that almost everyone wanted him to star in their movie, including two of the biggest Chinese producers at the time, Lo Wei and Willie Chan. Jackie had starred in movies produced by both these guys, but in the early 80s, he left Lo Wei to follow Willie Chan. This angered Lo Wei to a point where he would send members of the Triad to attack Jackie. At first, Jackie Chan tried speaking to the press against the Triad's hostile behavior towards actors in the movie industry. A little old Jackie had no idea the triad also controlled the press. Seeing as he was fighting a lost battle, he left China for Hollywood, expanding his fame. But the triad didn't let him get off that easy. On one occasion, when Jackie came back to China for a production in this movie, the triad ambushed him before he could even step off the plane. Thankfully, he wasn't hurt, but at the same time, their attacks didn't stop. They kept sending threats to him and orchestrating smaller attacks until he decided to retaliate. Jackie Chan began carrying guns and grenades with him anytime he was in Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah, he was ready for any attack. One time, while having dinner, 20 members of the triad ambushed him. But Jackie had three guns on him that day, and a fight broke out. We don't know exactly what happened, but the fallout from this scenario showed triads checking into the Hong Kong hospital later that day. Since then, the triad successfully ruined the movie scene in Hong Kong by navigating it towards adult content. We all know Jackie Chan went on to become one of the biggest actors in Hollywood. Number 8. Jimi Hendrix 
1969, top American guitarist Jimi Hendrix experienced one of the most insane kidnaps ever. You see, there was this guy named John Roberts who distributed cocaine for the Medellin cartel in the US and also had a few dealings with the mafia. On one fateful night, a bunch of celebs gathered at a club where Hendrix was performing. After the show, Roberts and his associates spiked almost every drink with quaaludes, leaving a handful of people high in the clouds. And Jimmy was not left out of this party. He wanted to take things further by seeking methamphetamine to inject into a system. This quest for the drug led him to meet two low-level drug dealers, who seized the opportunity to kidnap him. Hendrix was so high at the time that he didn't even know what was going on. The two boys lured him out of the club and far away into their apartment, on the pretense that they had some coke to share with him. But this was where the boys messed up. Instead of demanding money, they demanded Hendrix's contract from his manager, Michael Jeffrey, to secure his release. I know, it's pretty dumb, right? Well, after everyone noticed Jimmy was missing, the matter was reported to the club owner, John Roberts. Being that Roberts had some pretty solid connections in the narcotics underworld, he was able to find these guys and get Jimmy out. But our story doesn't end there. Hendrix spent the whole weekend with these guys and didn't even have a clue where he was. The boys kept handing heroin to him, making him retain that disastrous level of highness throughout. After Jimmy was released, these boys were beaten to a pulp. Some say Roberts orchestrated the kidnapping, while others say it was his manager, Michael Jeffrey, wanting to play the Good Samaritan. Now, whatever case is true, it's still crazy thinking how Hendrix was just completely unaware of what was going on, had no clue about what was happening. To put this all into context, the mainstream media had no idea about it until 2011 when Roberts brought it up. That simply made the experience both one of the most intriguing episodes to come to light about the singer's life and possibly one of the most entertaining abductions in the history of famous kidnappings. Number 7. Gordon Ramsay if you've ever tuned to TV shows like Hell's Kitchen or Kitchen Nightmares, you're likely familiar with celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay, renowned for his sharp tongue and high culinary standards. Ramsay's earned a reputation that demands respect. However, it looks like not everyone was well versed in the legend of Gordon Ramsay, with one such group of people being the Taiwanese shark fin smuggling group confronting this TV host during the filming of a documentary in Costa Rica. Ramsay would travel to South America, capturing segments for a documentary dedicated to the controversy and harmful practice of shark finning. If you don't know what that is, well, it's basically the most cruel practice of cutting a live shark's fin and throwing the animal back in the ocean to die a slow and painful death. And now you're asking why would anyone do this? Well, that's because shark fins bring in the money. We have shark fin soup costing over $100 per plate. And in some weird way, Ramsey just got himself trapped between shooting his documentary and running for his life. Since shark finning is illegal, these gangs basically dry thousands upon thousands of shark fins on the roofs of many buildings to evade the awareness of the government. Ramsey managed to climb to the top of one of these buildings, capturing the operation on camera. However, when he got down from that building, a group of thugs poured gasoline over his body from another rooftop. It smells like petrol. Still determined to uncover more of this illegal operation, Ramsey and his camera crew had a second attempt, but this time, they were held at gunpoint by armed men. Luckily for him, local law enforcement arrived after disturbed neighbors placed a call. They then instructed Ramsey and his team to just leave the country immediately. We can only imagine the horrific things that they would have done to him if those cops hadn't pulled up in time. Number 6. Al Sharpton Al Sharpton, a prominent American civil rights and social justice activist, once ventured into the high-stakes world of organized crime. He surprised many by becoming an FBI informant despite his respectful political career and his 2004 run for the Democratic presidential nomination. That's probably a lot of info to take in, but trust me, everything will make sense in a minute. So the first question, how does an ex-presidential candidate become an informant? Well, it started in the 80s before Sharpton found his way to the top of politics. At the time, he was involved with a few street gangs and the top crime families in New York, including the ruthless Genovese crime family. In one of his criminal escapades, he tried extorting funds from the Jacksons during their Pride Patrol tour, but failed. 
After that operation, he got a call from this mysterious man named Sal, who threatened to kill him. This was in addition to the fact that Sharpton was already under investigation for his links to the Gambino and Genovese family. But this was the point everyone realized, that Al Sharpton had always been one step ahead. He ran to the FBI and struck a deal with him in exchange for his freedom. The FBI then launched an investigative operation called CI-7, which stands for Confidential Informant Number 7. Under this operation, Sharpton helped take down multiple multiple members of the Genovese crime family, who were at the time one of America's biggest and most dangerous mafia circles. He also befriended several high-ranking members of the mafia, recording their conversations with a bugged briefcase. However, if you're asking if it was a success, well, it actually was. With the information he provided, the FBI was able to take down two Genovese family social clubs, including Gigante's Greenwich Village headquarters, three autos used by crime family leaders, and more than a dozen phone lines. But the twist of this story is is Al never openly admitted to his involvement with the FBI, nor did he deny him. It's still an open mystery how much he revealed to the FBI and how he eventually climbed so high in the ranks of politics. Number 5. The Rolling Stones There are two sides to this story. One involves the killing of a Rolling Stones fan by the Hells Angels, while the other revolves around the gang's attempt to kill a member of the band, Mick Jagger. December 6th, 1969. Rock band, the Rolling Stones, held a concert at the Altamont Speedway in Northern California, where they hired Hells Angels as security for $500 and a case of beer. Now, if you don't know who these people are, the Hells Angels are widely recognized as an international outlaw motorcycle club. But that's just a nice way of saying they're one of the worst crime syndicates out there. On this fateful day, the Hells Angels had agreed to prevent members of the audience from getting onto the stage. As these angels drank their beer and became intoxicated, the crowd became restless and unpredictable. You know how concerts go. It became worse when the Rolling Stones finally stepped on stage to perform. Everyone was in a frenzy, with numerous fights going on between the gang members and the crowd. Then out of nowhere, a teen named Meredith Hunter jumped on stage and climbed onto the speakers. The two gang members immediately immediately threw him back into the crowd. However, Hunter climbed back on stage, but this time with a gun in his hand. Now, Hunter was under the influence of drugs, impairing his rational thinking. He raised his gun to the air and fired a single shot. At that moment, an angel named Alan Pissarro swiftly drew his knife, disarmed Hunter, and subdued the teen by stabbing him. Tragically, the incident resulted in Hunter's death, while Pissarro was subsequently arrested and charged with murder. Fortunately, he was acquitted on the basis of self-defense. But this was just one side of the story. After the incident, Rolling Stone frontrunner Mick Jagger condemned the acts of the Hells Angels gang, stating about his plans to disassociate from the group. This left a lot of fingers pointing towards the group as a set of extremely violent individuals. So they decided to play by the narrative and kill Jagger. They loaded a bunch of ammo on a boat and set out to his house on Long Island. However, before they got there, this huge storm capsized their boat and they barely survived drowning in that river leading to their destination. After the incident, they dropped the plan to kill Jagger while Jagger himself had no idea this event even happened. Number 4. Steven Seagal Steven Seagal was almost everyone's favorite action film star back in the 90s. This guy was in blockbuster movies like Marked for Death and Under Siege, where he's taking out bad guys. However, as much as that was the persona of Seagal we got to see on our screens, he actually made secret ties with the Gambino family and he didn't even know. Let me explain. In the year 2000, Steven was kidnapped by two members of the Italian-American crime family, the Gambinos. These guys grabbed him, put him in their car, and planned to extort hundreds of thousands of dollars from Seagal. Now, from what we know Steven to be, this should have been an easy-peasy situation to get out of. Well, in reality, it wasn't. Seagal was a target of the Gambino family because of his dealings with a man named Julius Nasso. Julius had cast Seagal in about 10 of his movies, making both of them really good friends. However, throughout their time working together, Seagal had no idea about Julius's ties to this crime family. At some point, Julius and Steven stopped working together. After Seagal became a household name in Hollywood, Nasso was furious by this development, rightfully believing he played a significant role in his rise to success. In response 
to his feelings of betrayal, he sent two members of the crime family, Anthony Sonny Chacon and Primo Casarino, with the task of extorting $150,000 from Seagull for each movie they'd collaborated on. That would have potentially led to Seagull paying over a million dollars. But it's okay, they were able to settle for $700,000, which is still quite a lot to fork out in a short amount of time. Now the cherry on the cake for this story is how Steven was frightened by that ambush from both Mafia members. According to an investigation led by the FBI, both men laughed at how scared Seagal looked when they kidnapped him, pointing to the fact that he was the complete opposite of his TV persona. However, you can't blame Steven Seagal because life isn't a movie. But anyways, the truth eventually surfaced a few years later, revealing Seagal borrowed approximately $500,000 from Nasso to cover his taxes but refused to repay the loan. That refusal prompted Nasso to dispatch the mob after him. Nevertheless, Nasso himself faced charges of extortion conspiracy and was sentenced to one year in jail for the $700,000 he'd collected through the Gambino family, while Segal was told by the U.S. court to settle the half a million dollar debt he had incurred. Number 3. Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy Davis Jr. had to be one of the most talented and loved black male Hollywood entertainers in the 50s. However, that all kind of changed when he began dating a white woman named Kim Novak. Two things were wrong with this relationship. One was the fact that they were an interracial couple at that crazy time in America, while the second was that Novak was contracted to Harry Cohn, a powerful and ruthless manager with mob ties. History has it that Cohn put more people in the cemetery than all the other mobsters in Hollywood. He ran Columbia Pictures at the time and Novak was one of his biggest stars. However, after the two met at a party in 1957, they fell in love and entered an intimate relationship. But this was probably the worst mistake Sammy Davis Jr. made in his career. At the time, Davis was raking in $25,000 a week at the Sands in Las Vegas, and he was about to break into TV as one of the medium's first black actors to appear in a dramatic role. He also had lost an eye three years before meeting Novak in a ghastly motor accident. However, once he met her, there was an instant connection. Connection. Davis and Novak went to great lengths to evade both the press and Cone spies, usually having quiet, intimate dinners together. Other times, Davis would tell a friend to drive him to her place while he hid under a rug in the backseat of his car. Regardless of all the effort, Cone found out about that sneaky relationship after one of his spies broke the news to him. After all, nothing's ever truly hidden in Hollywood. Cohn was furious, not only because Novak was at the peak of her career, but because he genuinely liked her. So his feeling toward whatever they had going on was mixed with a bit of jealousy. Cohn would then pull out a few of his connections, getting men to beat Davis to a pulp. They not only beat him, but they also pulled out one of his eyes with a stick. When I said Cohn was a very bad man, I meant it. And after that beatdown, Cohn gave him 24 hours to marry a colored girl, unless he would rather die. A desperate Davis took out his address book and randomly chose a black singer named Larray White to marry. Larray was an attractive singer from Houston who had already been married twice at the age of 23 and also had a six-year-old at the time. Now, the two agreed to marry on the condition they get divorced at the end of the year. But six months later, Davis paid her $25,000 to divorce him. Number 2. Edward James Olmos Celebrities really do love their fans, but Edward here is supposedly being targeted by a dangerous group called the Mexican Mafia. Why? Well, it goes back to a movie he made in 92 called American Me. You see, in the film, Olmos portrayed the tough and harsh life of Chicano prison gangs. The movie didn't get the best reviews, and that's not even where the trouble began. Shortly after its release, two people who had helped with the movie were killed. Some believed it was because of the movie, and they were trying to send a warning to Olmos. The Mexican Mafia aka La M, was upset about how they were depicted in the film. The movie blurred the line between fact and fiction, suggesting that one of their founding members was murdered by his own gang. This made the group very angry. Wanting to protect himself, Olmos tried to get a permit for a concealed weapon, but he was denied, with the authorities thinking he wasn't in immediate danger. However, Olmos and those close to him believed differently. They thought his life was at risk. Some people even sent death threats while he was working on another movie called Roosters. It was rumored that that almost had fired some employees, and they weren't happy about it. But it was all in a bid to get armed guards to protect him while on set. So far, almost is safe, but no one knows for how long. He's still living his life with the mindset that any day, any time, this gang can take him out. And number one, the Beatles and the Cray Twins. 
For those unfamiliar with the Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie, they were notorious gangsters, holding control over London's criminal underworld in the 1960s. They're often considered some of the most infamous British criminals since Jack the Ripper. Now, before descending into criminal activities, the Cray brothers were amateur boxers, who were discharged from the army due to their unruly behavior. Ronnie Cray identified as bisexual, not gay, while Reggie was heterosexual. Now, Ronnie grappled with paranoid schizophrenia, making that partnership all the more intriguing. So now what's the connection between these infamous gangsters and the Beatles? It may seem like they have nothing in common, yet their paths crossed in subtle and not so subtle ways. In the late 50s, the Cray brothers were affiliated with a Liverpool gangster named Jay Murray, someone who likely intersected with the Beatles and their manager as they gained fame in the north of England. Once the Beatles made their way to London, they became regular gamblers at casinos owned by the Crays. The Beatles were a particularly tempting target for extortion. Not only were they the world's biggest musical act, but they also had adult tastes that didn't quite align with their squeaky clean public image. Their manager, Brian Epstein, was not only a gambler but also openly gay, and he had a penchant for rough trade. This combination made him vulnerable to blackmail. And that was all the information the twins needed to get a hold of the band. They wanted to manage a music group and chose the Beatles. Ronnie Cray visited Brian Epstein and outlined his plan. Epstein told Ron that managing a band like the Beatles consumed a lot of time and required expert knowledge. Ronnie, feeling like Epstein was treating him like he was stupid, grabbed a random man who just happened to be in the room and rammed a 15 centimeter nail through his neck to show how serious he was. Oh, Epstein accepted and the Cray twins managed the band for a little while, but things didn't go as smoothly as they'd envisage. Later, the Crays realized that managing a band like the Beatles would be too much work for them, so they would settle for extorting huge amounts of money from Epstein. Then they tried to take over a lower profile band called The Kinks. No one really knows the details of how the Cray twins managed that band, but we can safely say a lot of shady dealings must have gone down.